Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, have to apologize. I'm just a little bit stuffed up. Allow me to start off with the first slide here, if I can. Okay. Okay, this is, as you see, Ronald Reagan, Aaron Copeland, Victor Haywood, Winston Churchill, Willem de Kooning, Henry Ford, Frank Sinatra, and Jonathan Swift. What do they have in common? President, Prime Minister, singer, car model, author, composer, painter, actors. They all actually died with dementia of the Alzheimer's type. So clearly, therefore, uh, this is a painting by de Kooning when he was in the full creative force in 1952. This <coughs> is a painting when he had dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Now, you can debate here which one is more pleasant, um, but uh, obviously, clearly here, this is completely different. What happened to our sexual relationship? I don't know. I don't think they even sent us a Christmas card for them this year. Well, obviously, marbles become important as you get older. You want to make sure that you can keep your marbles as good as you possibly can. And there was a paper in Hypertension not too long ago looking at the benefits of cognitive function and blood pressure with insulin resistance to coca flavonoids. And I was actually asked by CNN to comment on this paper, and I did so. Um, then, this are, these are the conclusions that verbal fluency was improved, and you can see here that uh, this was mostly probably due to insulin resistance. So this, and the conclusions were that regular consumption of coca flavonoids may be effective in improving cognitive function in elderly subjects with mild cognitive impairment. And then there is a large French study in 14, almost 1,400 elderly subjects also showing that coca flavonoids uh, have, uh, did improve dementia in a five-year follow-up study. And finally, we have some studies in the rats. Now, this is a very interesting study. Uh, this, these rats had actually, in a water labyrinth, they had to find a target. And obviously, it took them some time to get there. You can see here, initially, when they were trained, it took them about 28 minutes, uh, seconds to get there. And then, when they were well trained, they did it in about uh, 8 or 10 seconds. But then as they got older and older and older, it took them longer and longer because obviously they had cognitive dysfunction. Now, interestingly enough, when they were given coca, you can see here that then they continued to do exceedingly well and there was no slowing down. And what even is more interesting here is they survived about 10% longer uh, when they were on coca than when they were not on coca. And even snails, and I didn't know snails had a memory, but even snails, you can improve the memory when you feed them chocolate or coca. Now, when I just uh, took the train here from Zurich, uh, I read the NZZ, and you can see here there it was an article to, in today's paper uh, talking about the brain and what they actually said, auch im Gehirn von den Erwachsenen werden anders als früher vermutet, noch ständig neue Nervenzellen gebildet. 
Now, we learned that this is indeed not the case, but obviously this is a paradigm that has changed now. And it's also, in this article, they say that certain medications could stimulate this, like antidepressants, SSRIs. So you may ha hypothesize that regular daily chocolate consumption possibly could stimulate neurogenesis, i.e. accelerate the normal production of cerebral cells. Now, this is a hypothesis that you know, I just developed while coming with the train from Zurich here. And then, <coughs> when we go to the heart, there is Roberto Corti here having a very nice article in circulation together with Norm Hollenberg and Tom Leisure actually explaining some of these effects. And you can see here probably the main effect of coca is on ENOS causing nitric oxide release. But it also has an ACE inhibitor uh, function and it has stimulates the prostaglandins uh, by COX-2. And obviously this translates in the vascular bed in a blood pressure reduction, in improved vascular function, reduced platelet reactivity, improved insulin sensitivity, and other anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, Corti and all state that the beneficial effects of KCO is most likely due to an increased bioavailability of nitric oxide. This may explain the improvement in endothelial function, the reduction in platelet function, and the potentially benefits effect on blood pressure, insulin resistance, and blood lipids. This is a meta-analysis uh, done in the British Medical Journal, and you can see here that COCA actually has some very positive effect on cardiovascular disease, not so much on heart failure, but again, fairly positive on stroke. And conclusion was that higher levels of chocolate consumption may be associated with a one-third reduction in the risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And there was a Cochrane meta-analysis on blood pressure. To make a long story short, you can see here there is a fall in blood pressure. And as we just have heard from Dave Holmes, even a small decrease, such as 2.8 over 2.2, may actually have, population-wise, an important impact. Now, the, uh, you want to consider, though, these are meta-analyses. And whenever you hear the word meta-analysis, actually a red flag should go up. A meta-analysis is like a sausage. Only God and the butcher know what goes in it. Neither would ever eat any. So, to be taken with a good grain of salt. Now, there's a very nice article on uh, coca that I would recommend you here. Um, by two colleagues from Zurich, uh, gives you a comprehensive overview about the cardio protection uh, about coca. Question is, is it the dark chocolate? And you can see here, grassy in hypertension, when you take white chocolate, it, the effect is not as pronounced as with dark chocolate. Now, Norm Hollenberg went into this here in an editorial, but he makes it very clear that it's not the dark in the chocolate. It should be obvious that the percentage of coca, like the color of chocolate, does not represent a measure of the flavanols. We need to know how much flavanols are in there in order to have some idea about the health benefits. But coca could actually be the superfood. As you can see here, it has more uh, flavonoids than acai, blueberries, cranberries, pomegranate, and when you look at the antioxidants, again, it's a rather powerful antioxidant. Interestingly enough, people do not think that chocolate is healthy. These are 17 diet dietary supplements um, among outpatients attending a cardiology clinic, a thousand outpatients, as you can see here, and they still use fish oil, although we know that this is probably no longer so efficacious. They still use vitamin E, and again, this has been deflated, and they use folic acid and so on, but coca is not on the list. Now, the hypothesis was, since chocolate consumption could improve cognitive function not only individually, but possibly the general population, a correlation might be expected between this consumption and cognitive function among various countries. 
You can easily find chocolate consumption there. Numerous lists here, and not surprisingly, Switzerland has the highest chocolate consumption of about 12 kilograms per capita per year. And conceivably, the total number of Nobel Prize laureates per capita could give us some measure of the overall cognitive function of a given country. So what I did uh, is download this uh, um, Nobel Prize laureate per capita. And you can see here there are some like Luxembourg, Santa Lucia, and the Faroe Islands that have more than Switzerland, but we don't have any chocolate consumption available from these. And then I plotted chocolate consumption against Nobel Prize laureates. And surprise, surprise, but you can see here there was a rather stunning close correlation between the two with an impressive correlation coefficient of 0.791 and the P of 0.0001. I did this somewhere in a rainy, uh, in, a, in a hotel in a rainy day, and I didn't know what I should do with this. And the question is, now what? So I decided very simply uh, to shoot for the stars and submitted it to the New England Journal. And I've submitted a few papers to the New England Journal. Usually it's a long back and forth. They want everything to be corrected. Here, within a week, I got this back. They want to have it published right away without making any revisions whatsoever. It has never happened to me ever. And the article was published in the New England Journal subsequently, um, as you can see here. Now, as you can see, Sweden is indeed an outlier. And the point I made there that with a per capita chocolate consumption of 6.4 kilograms per year, Sweden should have produced a total of about 14 Nobel laureates, yet we observed 32. Thus, the observed exceeds the expected by more than twofold, meaning that either the Nobel Committee in Stockholm has some inherent but patriotic bias, or that the Swedes are particularly sensitive to chocolate and even minuscule amounts greatly enhance their cognition, either one of the two. In any event, when you eliminate the Swedes, then it's even a much better correlation, as you can see here. Peter Slide thinks it's a conflict of interest because I'm Swiss. This is a slide he made up. And then we have Rolf Zinkernagel. I did some military service with Rolf, and uh, you know, he won the Nobel Prize in 1996, and I shoot him, did shoot him an email and asked him, uh, how much chocolate did you actually eat in 1996? And he, uh, I seem to be an outlier because my yearly consumption is less than 500 grams. Sorry, I shall let you know when I'm in York. All the best. Rolf, this is Swiss chocolate consumption, 12 kilograms for every man, woman, and child per year. And this is Professor Zinkernagel here, obviously not so much. But there could be an explanation here. And this is Eric Cornell, another Nobel Prize winner uh, in 2001. And he was interviewed by Reuters at the Wall Street Journal. And he stated, I attribute essentially all my success to a very large amount of chocolate that I consume. Personally, I feel that milk chocolate makes you stupid. Now, dark chocolate is the way to go. It's one thing if you want a medicine or chemistry Nobel Prize, but if you want a physics Nobel Prize, it pretty much got to be dark chocolate. So, physics Nobel Prize, this brings up Albert Einstein. And most recently, there was a re-examination of Einstein's brain. Um, just published in uh, November last year, and this is the brain here, and you are now very, very well informed on uh, brain and anatomy about the previous lecture here by Dr. Kovias. And as you can see here, this is uh, the, the brain of Einstein, and the conclusions there were that it has an extraordinary prefrontal cortex which may have contributed to the neurological substrate for some of his remarkable cognitive abilities. Well, obviously this is possible. Remember, Einstein also had a Swiss passport. And he went, uh, he did the Matura in Aargau, and these are actually the grades he had there. It's reassuring to see in physics he had at least a, a good grade, although some of the others are not that good. 
and became an American citizen. But when you look at the citizenship of his, he was stateless when he came to Switzerland in 1896 and remained a Swiss citizen, citizen until he died in 1995. So he was exposed 59 years to possibly Swiss chocolate. And when you examine his brain here a bit closer, you can see there may be a little bit of lint chocolate left there to be seen. We still remain with a p-value of 0 0.001. And that's of concern. If this is a nonsense co correlation, then no, those among us in research, we live and stand by the p-value. I'll give you another one, and Tom Lusher had it recently in the European Heart Journal. This is the decrease in the stork population in Germany from 1965 to 1980. And this is the decrease in newborn babies in Germany during the same time period, and when you calculate the correlation, it's 0.982. Now, you're going to say, come on, but this I can explain. This I can explain, because this is what the stork likes. They like free space, farm, and this is also conducive to have children. This is what the stork does not like. And this is also not conducive to have many children. So I think it's actually the common denominator here between the dwindling in birth rate and brooding storks is excessive urbanization and, and construction. Okay. Now, can we have the video? Well, it doesn't play here. No. Could eating chocolate get you a Nobel Prize? It's not as crazy an idea as it might sound. Research published in the New England Journal of Medicine shows a clear correlation between the amount of chocolate each person in a country eats and the number of Nobel Prize winners that country has produced. Of course, what makes the research intriguing is that we really want to believe it. Who wouldn't want to get smart overdosing on Lindor truffles? And to make it all the more compelling, there are plausible scientific reasons why chocolate might increase cognitive ability in some cases. The trouble is, the research just shows an association between chocolate consumption and that coveted call from the Swedish Academy of Sciences. What it doesn't show is causation. As the author points out, it could be that smart people like eating chocolate. Or there could be some other factor that's common to both Nobel laureates and chocolate eating. Take owning a cat, for instance. What if cat owners eat chocolate and are smarter than the average non-cat fancier? Amazingly, the cat chocolate Nobel thing works. Not only do the number of cats per capita in a country correlate with the amount of chocolate each person eats, but they also correlate with the number of Nobel Prizes per head of population. The problem is, without evidence of cause and effect, these data are nonsense. And this is where risk comes in. It's easy to see associations between different things, especially when we want to believe. It's much harder to identify where those associations actually mean anything. And this is important if you're trying to work out whether being exposed to substance X, for instance, really is dangerous, or whether you're just having a Nobel chocolate moment. Now, for I more did actually, insights into the, uh, move science on to of the risk, next slide. Don't forget to I did look at the cat correlation. It's, as you can see here, not by no, no means as strong. This is cats per capita, and this is the Nobel Prize laureates, but it's a p value of 0 0.005. And then, if we can go to the next slide, please. We'll stop again. Remove the slides, please. Okay. Go back some. Uh, oh, go back. Yeah, go ahead. And then cows. That's another issue. Very briefly, there was an article in the uh, um, Practical Neurology finding that milk consumption was actually very nicely 
correlated to Nobel Prize laureates, and the correlation with milk does not find Sweden an outlier absolving the Nobel Committee from Western suggestion of a patriotic bias. And finally, there are some other correlations that were put forward. Uh, the one I found most interesting is between the number of IKEA stores per um, 10 million population and Nobel Prize laureates. Obviously, Ubi, IKEA, Ibi, Chocola, you can make a point there. The p-value of 0 0.001 remains. If you want to go to Stockholm, obviously eat your chocolate. And finally, this is a painting by Juan Miró, a Rolex Oyster Perpetual, and Ernest Hemingway. What do they have in common? They have in common what Hemingway stated about the heart. It's just a muscle. Only it's the main muscle. It works as perfectly as a Rolex Oyster Perpetual. Trouble is, you cannot send it to the Rolex representative when it goes wrong. When it stops, you just don't know the time. You are dead. And that brings me to the last slide. I'm sorry to go two minutes over. The person least likely to have a heart attack He's an effeminate municipal worker, a bomber, completely lacking physical and mental alertness, has no drive, ambition, or competitive spirit, has never attempted to meet the deadline. He's low in income, blood pressure, blood sugar, uric acid, cholesterol. He has been on nicotinic acid, lint chocolate, and long-term anticoagulant therapy ever since his prophylactic castration. With apologies to Irv Page. Thank you so much.